floss tube. It's Arlene here. It is Friday, April 5th, 2024. Uh, welcome back. If you are coming back to see me, welcome if you are new and have just found me. Um, as always, we all know there's lots of floss tube channels to watch and I appreciate you taking a few minutes of your day to come see mine. Let's uh, talk about the big news of the day. I live in central New Jersey and we had an earthquake this morning. Now, as you may imagine, um, especially if you're in the U.S. and you know some geography, the East Coast does not get earthquakes very often. Um, the last time, I meant to double check this, but I remember, and I had to look the data, 2011, which may have been the last time there was one on the East Coast, or certainly one that I felt. Um, and when I looked it up this morning, it was, um, the center was in uh, Southern Virginia. So I definitely remember feeling it, but this morning I definitely felt this more. Um, and I've learned that the center was only about 50 miles away from where I live. Uh, I've seen different reports, 4.8, 4.7 um, magnitude. It was, it was funny because I was downstairs. So up here is, is a loft space. And I live in like a, a condo townhouse kind of area, a building that, so my immediate neighbors have the same layout. So they also have this like loft space. And I, um, one of them has a teenage son. This is, I think, it's the teenage son who just seems to stomp around a lot. Like, I feel like when he must be stomping down those stairs, I like feel the little shake. I mean, that's, but the point is, in the first few seconds, I thought, man, is he really stomping around upstairs? And within like two, three seconds, I realized, um, that's not uh, my neighbor's kid. Uh, and so it was very odd. Um, I feel like I have a lighting thing going on. Oh, I know why. Um, cause like the lights I usually have are on as normal, but above me, I've talked about this before, there's a skylight and, um, with the moving along toward spring into summer season and where the sun is, I'm getting some light coming in there and that's why it's feeling funny. All right, we're just gonna keep going. Anyway, so the earthquake, earthquake, here I am immortalizing it forever, at least as long as you know, YouTube last <laughs> that I experienced it Friday, April 5th, 2024. So, um, I've been wanting all week to make a video just to catch up on a number of different projects and things. And, um, and it takes until Friday afternoon sometimes, but there you go. So, um, if you are not familiar with me, I design under the name works by ABC. I've been a stitcher way longer than I was a designer. I started floss tube before I started designing, well, designing and selling my patterns. I've always for many, many, many years have designed some of my own things of different types of needlework. And that's a piece that um, I love sharing is that I, while many floss tube, uh, floss tubers, floss tube videos are focused really predominantly on cross stitch. And a lot of stitchers will, will share some other hobbies like, like quilting or knitting or things. Um, in addition to cross stitch, I do other kinds. And that the reason I'm bringing that up right now, cause that's definitely a focus um, of today's uh, video, or at least some of the things I have to share with you. That said, let's start talking cross stitch. Um, so in my last video a few weeks ago was my post Nashville, you know, rundown, <coughs> excuse me. I, um, this year was my third year exhibiting at Nashville and it was wonderful and great to see people meet, meet store owners, um, have them see my models in person. And so the video before that was me sharing, revealing my Nashville, my new for Nashville pieces. The last video was sort of just sharing a little bit about the Nashville experience. Um, and so I'll, as of just a few days ago, this Monday, I'll, all of my Nashville releases are now available on my Etsy store. And I'll put links below um, for each of my designs, not just these Nashville ones, since I started designing uh, every design has two listings. One is the PDF version and one is the paper copy. You can't in Etsy world make that an option. Like I know sometimes you're, you know, on a, on a listing and you're like, Ooh, a drop down menu. I can choose blue or green. So I could make choices like that, but you can't make a choice between an item that is being sent to you and a PDF item. So that's why I have two listings. All of that will be listed below. And I'll talk a little bit, particularly about one of those, 
uh, designs as we go on in this video. Um, so just to go back, all that's cross stitch. Uh, I have put out some designs in the past, black work, and, and very early on I was doing some canvas work designs. Um, but I'm also aware of the cross stitch world that I'm a part of, this floss tube world, which really got me into you know, I was so grateful when I first discovered floss tube. I still am very grateful. I just first discovered floss tube in 2017. And you know what I just realized? We are past my six year anniversary on floss tube because I'm almost positive it was March. Um, I will, uh, I, I'll have to look update anyway. Happy sixth floss. No, oh God, it's seven, right? 24. 2017, yes, seven years of doing floss tubes. That's crazy, or it feels crazy to me. Okay, anyway, let me talk a little bit more about, so all my um, patterns from Nashville are now available in my Etsy store. You may have been purchasing them from your LNSs, any stores that attended Nashville. The, the idea is if a store is gonna spend the time and the money to attend at Nashville, th there should be you know, something in it for them. And that something is having first dibs of um, offering patterns to stitchers out there. But mo many designers who are um, saving the patterns, which is called making it an exclusive, at some point, and there isn't a hard and fast rule, but four to six weeks, I think most people will say, um, many designers will then make their patterns available through other sources, whether it's selling directly to the public as I do, um, sending to distributors, which I will also do, but I have not yet done. So one of, not one, the biggest seller for me was my 324 design. And I just meant, oh, it's put away right now. I meant to have it out. Well, you could go to the, um, you know, the snapshots, not screenshot of my previous video and you could see me holding it. Uh, I was blown away by the, by its popularity and by the interest out there. On uh, March 24th, 324, uh, there was a sale that started and on Instagram, so many people were posting their beginning of it. It was just overwhelming to me as a designer that something I created was enjoyed is enjoyed by so many stitchers. Um, you want to hope that every design you, you know, there's interest in this group of people, that group of people, but um, this was just more people than I had ever experienced. And so when I opened, when I made the listings available this coming, this past Monday, I knew a lot of people were waiting for the PDF version. And let's just say my Etsy store has been the busiest it's, it's ever been this week. Um, with almost all the sales being PDFs of either 324 or other designs. So let me launch into, well, I meant, I'm pretty sure I started to talk about this in my last video, but things have progressed since then. I've been working on a new version of 324. And so let me just go ahead and show you. Oh gosh, you know what? We're going to be dealing with the sun. All right. um, and if you look closely, those are not cross stitches. I mean, some of them have some stitches that are crossing. So, and I never thought I, when I, I never thought this was going to turn into what it did. Um, I, uh, if you are not familiar, there is a magazine out there called Needlepoint Now. Uh, it is very much needlepoint focused, um, both painted canvas as well as uh, counted canvas. And I love doing counted canvas and I have more to talk about that um, in this video. And back in the fall, I saw advertisements for this design, which is a stitch along they're putting in, you know, I think they do six magazines a year. And it wasn't about the colors. It wasn't about doing a patriotic thing for me. It was about all the different stitches. Now I own plenty of, oh, they're sort of off camera. On these shelves here, are a lot of needlework books, including a lot of like canvas work stitches, like the kind of things if you did painted canvas and wanted to refer to, or when I do any kind of stitching. And there was something about seeing these blocks that made me come back to this idea. And the idea was really born before, really before I, I had shared anything about my national releases. I, I sort of knew I kind of wanted to do this. And then when 324 sort of exploded, um, it was, well, am I really doing this? Only because, and things have changed. When I first started talking about this in the last video, actually what I showed you, I'm pretty sure 
I started it about three different times in different sizes and configurations. And I'm not even sure if what I showed you is what I ended up doing. So these are 12 by 12 blocks um, and there's no border between them. And I know I was showing you something else in the previous video. So when I did 324, I remember, and I said this so many times, I knew it had great visual appeal. I had no idea there were that many people out there that wanted to stitch with 324 different colors. Well, I was proven wrong. When I started talking about this, I was, I said on the video, I've said it in Instagram posts. I said it in person at a retreat, which I'll come back to in a moment, um, that I was doing it for me because I didn't think anyone else would be interested in doing it in the typical audience that I have, which is mostly cross stitchers. Would anyone be interested in doing this many different kinds of specialty stitches and we you can sort of question what is that really defined as but basically stitches that are different from um oh great how rare it is that i get a phone call there we go um stitches that are different from cross stitch so for me this was going to be a project i was doing for myself not to mention the fact how long it would take to chart out because this is not just you know click 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 of boxes that in a cross stitch program so um but then i started sharing a little bit and i've started to get feedback like comments on my posts of people who are actually interested in this so I have started leaning more and more toward eventually maybe putting out a pattern. So let me just to share the details. Oh, the sun. Um, it's the same color scheme, you know, and the each it's 324 boxes, each um, stitch. I'm doing 81 different stitches. So each of them are being done four times. Uh, I did not, wasn't going to try and come up with 324 different stitches. So just to focus on one that maybe you can visually see clearly. Yeah, where am I? I can't see what I am. Like if you look at that right there, it is also there. It is, uh, it's, where is it? It, I can't see where it is here. Oh, it's there because it's in such light color and it's there. And why am I doing it in this sort of odd configuration? Because I knew I wanted the four quadrants. I had started out doing stitches here until I could repeat them down here once I had that all in place. Because my goal was to get to the point where I could do take that stitch, figure out what I'm doing with it, and then do it four times in a row and not have to think about it again. Like I said, I started taking notes so that if I do end up charting this all out, I'd be able to chart it all out so oh also so I started with the boxes with the stitches that were in that magazine and more and more I was veering away from what was being shown and then I kind of went through the stitches that I wanted to use from the two issues that I have and then I just started going off on my own so at this point there's more stitches that I've created than what I've pulled from that magazine um and I, I counted right before I started this I'm over the halfway point I think there's 176 that are done and I like the way it's turning out. And like I said, um, I mean, definition of a specialty stitch. It, I don't know what you call I mean, for some people, it's like doing a Jessica or doing a, um, uh, I don't, I'm trying to think other ones that um, cross stitchers have mentioned in the past. Um, this is all I could chart this. And again, I think there might be an interest in it. So we shall see. Right now, I'm having fun with it. Um, there is this like, a uh, not guilt, but I have other things I need to be stitching. And when I say need to, I'm talking about cross stitch design, some of which that have deadlines. And so it's been like this, you know, psychological game I play with myself. I want to be stitching on this. And this has mostly been my, um, evening stitch project, but I try to get some stitching time in during the day at some point. And so I've got actually right over here is one design I'm working on with a deadline. And I've got another one lined up that, uh, I'll come to in a moment, um, as well as some other things playing. So, but for right now, I'm indulging myself in stitching on this. Uh, I don't have a name for it yet. I've been sort of jokingly call it 324 version 2.0. Um, again, if I come out with a chart, I'd have to make sure it's a name that becomes very clear what it is. What is it? I, I started out calling it a counted canvas work design. And I think that may throw some people off. What fabric am I using? I'm using what's called 24 count Congress cloth. Congress cloth is 
a bit stiffer than a lot of cross stitch fabrics are, but it's not as stiff as like canvas. And so for me, whenever I've not all, but many canvas work designs, counted canvas work designs that I've done, I've used Congress cloth because I, I just like them to be a little bit smaller than um, a typical canvas is like 18 count or even like 13 count, which I've never used. Um, so, but when I was at the retreat a few weeks ago, I was working on this and a lot of people were seeing it visually and I was having conversations about it. And someone asked the direct question, well, does it have to be done on this fabric? And the answer is no. I mean, there's something to be said about many of these stitches are two strands of DMC. There's a few I did with one strand. So there's some element of whatever size you fabric you use, you just want to keep in mind something that you might want to do, be able to do two strands and one strand. But I could have been doing this on a piece of fabric. And anyway, I, I've just, I, we shall see where it goes. If you think you are interested, like you would purchase a pattern and it would be, it would be taking me a long time to chart it out and it would take a lot of pages. So it would be probably a little more expensive than a typical cross stitch chart. Um, but let me know if you think you might be interested, it might help me really get the initiative to start working on charting it. Okay. That was an awful lot about, but that's been my big project. And that was the biggest thing to talk about. Um, I mentioned that I have a project that's going on over here and a project that's sitting here. I just wanted to share with you a few weeks ago, um, in Nashville, I had a great conversation with the guy from Threadworks. Uh, and a few weeks ago he sent me, uh, I asked for a few samples of, of threads and I, you know, and I picked out what colors I wanted and it's like, I, oh my gosh, I want to do something with these. So I have this idea. It's a monochrome design and I picked out what I decided would be my favorite. I'm looking for white paper. Maybe I don't even need that. And I've pulled out some fabric. And so this, as of this moment is the plan. It's so it's a, it's a lavender with like gray overtones. Some of the dark, I just, I love the combination. And I really wanted a monochrome design to, to really see how the over dye shows up in the thread works. I've used a couple of them before, but really not in a way that could potentially really show the beauty of a, of an over dyed, over dyed thread. Um, I have planned out to use this fabric. I may have talked about this before. It's a Witchell fabric. Um, I am not a, a big fan of Witchell linen works for some people. It doesn't. Um, but they, as a designer, they are willing to, you know, give me some things. And there's one point I was looking through their list and I saw this listing for something called country French or country French, or is it just country Lin it was, and I remember emailing the person, I said, well, what is this? And she's talking about the difference percentage cotton versus linen or whatever. And I said, could you send me a sample of a piece? And unlike the linen that I've experienced, which I have found very stiff, this is not. And I'm like, wow, I want to, I want to stitch some things on this. So I have a couple of different ones. This one is called Mocha, Cafe Mocha. It's a 32 count and it only seems to come in a 32 count. I don't know if you've ever seen it in any store that you have. I don't know if you can order it online um, through any LNS, but I'm going to give it a try with this thread. And at some point in the future, when I'm sharing this design, I will have a full report to share with you about it. Okay. So I talked about canvas work earlier, or I mentioned it in some way. So in addition to all the cross stitch designing, I have done canvas work, black work, hard anger, a number of others. And, uh, I don't remember it. I feel like I was going to talk about this. I feel like I was going to talk about this in my last video and then the video was already too long and I'm like, oh, I'll just save it till next time. Um, let me just jump into it. This is a canvas work design. I did not design it, um, that I finished a few weeks back again, sort of like stitching that was not model stitching. I want to say stitching for me because when I'm stitching my models, I'm still stitching for me. Non cross stitch design stitching that I'm not in any way putting out there as a design, especially if it's not my design or that it's already been created. So I've shared this before. Um, there is a, uh, counted canvas work designer named uh, Curdy Biggs, and she designs on the name Threedles, you know, like the word needle, but you know, TH. Um, and I remember seeing like images online 
blogs, whatever, some years ago and thinking there was such an interesting appeal to them, but they were, it was like too much. And the appeal was all the different stitches and, and I couldn't even tell, but as I learned lots of different threads, but what didn't appeal to me was the lots of different colors. And I've talked about this before because I, this was my sort of self analysis. Curdy uses lots of different stitches, lots of different threads, lots of different colors. And to me, three things is too much. If you had two of those, lots of colors and, uh, lots of threads, lots of colors, but lots of stitches, lots of stitches. But it seems like it would work, but for me, three of them didn't work. So the first one I did of hers, um, and actually, I, I don't remember, I, I have seen like her trunk show model of this at some point was this, and this one isn't even that like, it isn't a huge variety of color. It's called cathedral. And, um, I know I've shown this in the past. Uh, this is what I did with it. So I basically was trying to make a monochrome design, uh, blue and gold beads also. And you can see some of the Threads are sparkly, some are not. There's cotton, there's, I might be silk. There's definitely like uh, lots of shiny things. And I really love the way it turned out. I, I, I was mostly using her stitches, but really kind of, I don't remember, no, probably, I'll say mostly. I mean, you could definitely see, it's not, I have not created, I'm not taking credit for creating this. I've just very much made it my own because of my thread color choices. Some, few years after doing that, I had wanted to do it again. And I picked out this design of hers called a different view. And I did it one in red and same principle. This time I, I did red, different kinds of threads, acts, all kinds of accents with gold, lots of different stitches. I just, I find this kind of stuff fun to do to kind of like explore how it different stitches show up. Um, and so it had been on my mind for quite some time on that forever. What will I stitch when I want to not be stitching a cross stitch list? And I want, it was after I basically finished stitching all my Nashville models. And I was like in this sort of stitching slump of, um, and that's when I'd like turn to that list and say, what's on here. I, I don't need to be stitching a model right now. And so the green version came into play. I had already... So this one is called cat's eyes. I did not do the corners. I, at no point was I planning to do corners of it. I wanted to just do this. Um, uh, I had collected threads some time ago. The, so this is canvas that it's on, um, do this. but it has spark it, uh, like opalescent. It has uh, gold sparkles in it. And, um, I had collected a number of green threads some time back. I had the canvas and it was one of those at some point. So when I was getting this project set up, I discovered however long ago it was that I was thinking ahead. I'd actually bought a piece of canvas that was twice this size that I was keeping open the idea of doing a fourth one. And as I was stitching along and I really was enjoying and, you know, collecting different green threads and, oh, I got to come up with a solution for this and find something different for there. Um, I did start thinking. <laughs> So my plan right now is to do a fourth one in using purple. And then I think those four together, a blue, a red, a green, and a purple in very like royal colors, bold colors, jewel colors, whatever you call those would look really cool hanging together. If I got them all framed, you know, similarly. Um, so I've start, I started collecting uh, purple threads. I got this one off of eBay and I like this one. There is another one and I think it's called diamond eyes that I think I like more. And at some point, well, it's sort of like, I should, I should find a place and buy it now, even if it's taking a, you know, a couple of years until I end up doing it. Cause that's what it was. I think I bought these green threads like easily two years ago. Maybe it wasn't before COVID. Maybe it was even before COVID. Anyway, if I like the other one, I should probably get my hands on it because it, I don't know whether they're out of print so much as she doesn't put out new things. Her world has moved a lot, as I understand it, to um, like classes and seminars, like EGA, ANG, those kind of um, things, which is just what works for her as a designer. So the other thing that I was stitching, and I know I showed this at some point in an earlier video, is a piece of gold work. So gold work 
should I say stitch with gold threads? Um, but they're not like, like a petite treasure braid metallic thread like that. There's some fancy gold threads. I had started this project. Where is the thing that oh. I owned this for many years. Um, Tanya Berlin, uh, who are, her designs are Berlin embroidery design. She's out of Alberta, Canada. She has this gold work sampler and it's just four little, um, motifs. And by doing all four, you get exposed to a lot of different, um, gold work threads and techniques, especially if you buy the thread kit. <laughs> Um, and this was an indulgence many, many years ago and something I'd always wanted to do. And at some point last few months, I started it. So I did the first one. And in that post Nashville time, I don't know if it was exactly the same point I was working on the canvas work, the goal work I want to do sitting up here because I need a table for much more than like sitting down on the couch when I'm doing stitching in front of the television kind of thing. So I started working on the second motif. This is, and you can see with a lot of gold work that has dimension to it, you might put a piece of what's basically just felt down and then you put gold threads over it. I know I hit a frustration point and I know that stopped me because of this, you know, it's funny. And I look at it now, especially from a distance, I'm like, okay. But looking at it um, close up, I was, and I pulled the thread. It's called, this thread is called Gilt Fine Rococo and it's very thick. And it's got this like nifty little wavy thing going on. And it's so thick that it's hard to get it. Like a lot of gold work things, you are laying on top of the thread and then you just have to get a little part of the end to the back and then you secure it somehow. That thread is so thick. Like I took out some beading supplies and took like, is it called an awl? A-W-L? To try and literally poke a hole in the fabric, which was working. Um, but all five of these leaves, um, use this same thing. And I, I just, I don't want to get back to it. I just want to do it. It, it'll, you know, it's a, it's a learning piece. That's all it is. It's not supposed to, not supposed to be perfect. You're learning new things. Um, I, but I'm not abandoning this project at all. It just has certainly taken a back seat because I hit that frustration point. And I know lots of people in whatever project, whatever type of needlework you do, we all, we all hit points like that. You know, you've made a mistake and you know, you need to frog a whole thing out and then you decide to step away from it for a little bit. So the canvas work, the goal work, currently stitching on canvas work, currently stitching on cross stitch. A um, few other little things to share with you. I mentioned earlier going to a retreat a few weeks ago. I had a really great time. I, um, I had, I call 2019 my year of retreats. I, did I go to five? You know, that's in my early years of floss tube and meeting new friends and all of that. And then COVID happens and all. Of, um, and there, so there was a huge chunk of time between October of 2019 and August of 2023 that the only retreats I had been to, stitching retreats I'd been to, were the ones that I put on. <laughs> I run a Stitch NJ in July Um and it's just, I've loved doing it. It's something I give to the cross stitch community, bringing people together. Um, but as you can imagine, even though I, you know, get little bits here and there of sitting down and stitching, I am constantly, you know, figuring out what's going on next. What do I need to think about who needs what kind of thing? Um, and so when I went to a retreat last August, which was the grace notes retreat, it was, it felt really good to just sit there and be a stitcher. Where I went a couple of weeks ago was uh, a Needlefest extravaganza. It's put on, uh, he was now going by Needlework with, Needlework by Jim? Needlework with Jim. Um, it was it, relatively local. It was like an hour away from me. I mean, in theory, I could have like commuted back and forth. forth but some of my stitch friends were going to be there. And, and of course, that... That made it great just to spend a few days with friends um, in person. Yes, we're stitching, but we're also chatting and we're doing a lot of laughing. And that that was great. And as it turned out, I remember sort of being a little frustrated with what am I going to bring to stitch? Because I was in that in-between stage of what am I working on design-wise. And I had started working on the, the new version of 324. And I'm like, but I can't bring all my DMC threads and how many am I going to get done? And... I ended up saying, this is what I want to be working on right now. This is what I want to be stitching. So I sat down and I pulled, I don't know how many, um, maybe about 40 or so of the threads. And I didn't get through all of them, but 
of the colors that I knew I would need for that. And it was actually really wonderful to be working on something in person. People walk by tables all the time. People stop and look at what you're working on. And it just gave me the opportunity to talk about it. And again, it gave me some feedback of how others thought it was kind of cool to be doing something like this. Um, if you can cross stitch, you can do the stitches that are in there. There's none of like the fancy crisscrossing things that, um, you might've seen me when I was holding up the green or the other colored canvas work pieces. Um, so that again, it was, it was good to have some in-person conversations and it was anyway, I had a great time being with my friends. I have talked about before my scissor collection that I, um, oh, let me just, it, Needlework Extravaganza was about an hour away at an Embassy Suites hotel. Um, there was a big ballroom for stitching. There were a lot of classes going on. I wasn't interested in any of them. And there were vending rooms. Vending rooms in the model of Nashville are also like Needlework Galleria, which takes place in St. Louis, um, where there's a room like your embassy suites room and you set it up like your store. Now I could have, um, been a vendor. I could have set up my whole, you know, all my models brought my patterns and done that. The truth was I wanted to sit with my friends and stitch. And if I had been a vendor, I would have been required to be in my room and selling during many hours. Um, so Jim did have a number of my models in at a trunk show within his room where they were selling all the, um, all the things they had. And so a number of people did get to see my Nashville things like 324 and the Majestic Lace. And I know definitely there were copies that were purchased of various designs. Um, so my tradition of the needlework events that I've been to since my first retreat in 2017 is to have a pair of scissors and a scissor fob that help me remember the retreat. And in some cases I had to buy the scissors afterward and it was just a scissor fob, but more and more in these last couple of years, it's been tried, try to get a scissor and something for a fob, um, while you're at the event. Um, I did not do much purchasing as is typically the case. Many of my friends did, many of the people were supporting the vendors there. Absolutely. Um, I did see some, a couple of vendors that were selling some scissors and they were like the the really fancy stuff. And that's not what I want for this, my little collection. Um, and one after one of the afternoons I had run out for basically to, I think I went out to get, get something for lunch. And then I was helping my friends out and picking up a couple of things. I think I went at a target that was right nearby and right next to the target was a Michaels. I thought, you know what? I went in and bought a pair of scissors, like the cheapest little embroidery scissors, which are actually pretty decent scissors. Um, that I could find. And so, yes, they came from a Michaels, but they were bought during the retreat. <laughs> they were used during the retreat. So in my mind that counts. And I was contemplating the time sitting there. What am I going to use for a scissor fob? And then because I was doing so many different colors and de depending on them, I, you know, I might have a little, not a little bit of thread left, but more significant piece. I started keeping anything that was of significant length. I started keeping that thread. And I ended up braiding together all of the threads that I had. And there we go. There's my little uh, souvenir from Needle Fest Extravaganza. Uh, it, I really enjoyed myself. And, and I wasn't even like doing a lot of the shopping or taking classes. And I know people who were doing those things um, really enjoyed them. I, there was raffles and stuff. And a couple of my friends won some big things, which was pretty awesome and a lot of fun. A couple more things on my list, just things I like to share with you guys. I uh, have talked in the past about uh, some volunteer work I do in March of every year. There is a gigantic used book sale that is uh, local to me, and, and it takes place in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, it is the Bryn Mawr Wellesley book sale. I'm a Wellesley alum, but a lot of people, and so that's its origin. But nowadays, I think there's more like you have a sign in sheet when you're uh, when you're signing in and you there's a column where you write um, B for Bryn Mawr, W for Wellesley or F for friend, which is to say you're not a graduate of either of those colleges. You're just involved in the book sale. And nowadays there's way more F's in that column than B's or W's, which is fine. But it is sometimes I do get to meet some alums. Um, but anyway. I have volunteered there for many years. I very much enjoy doing the setup days rather than the um, selling days. And the category I'm in charge of is hobbies. So yeah, the per, um, selfish reason is to get first dibs on any books I might find there. Uh, more 
learn more. There isn't too much that I'm interested in, but you, it's always a treasure hunt. You just never know. So, um, hobbies is a big catch all category. Like a lot of people who walk by my tables when I, and I have some pictures on Instagram that you could, to get a real sense this, they spread out. It's, they rent out a school space during like the school spring break and picture two large gyms, two filled with tables of books. It's huge. They, they call it one of the largest book, used book sales on the East coast. I don't know how that gets determined, but it is a very large book sale. Um, so I think I had like 22 boxes or something like that to unpack. There is people donate throughout the year and there's various places to drop off. And as the drop off plate, not various, there's a place to drop off. And as that place gets filled, they rent storage unit. And then as it gets filled again, they rent the next storage unit. So there's storage going on throughout the year. And then for the setup of the sale, basically moving companies come in, bringing all these boxes. So they're already sorted, you know, like fiction books there and gardening there and cooking there and so on. And so hobbies becomes a real catch all category. Like we probably the most people who are watching this are going to think, Ooh, needlework and quilting and knitting. And absolutely. But there's also a lot of like painting and drawing and crossword puzzles and, um, and like craftiness of like, Oh, it's a huge category. And so I take the time, like they come in boxes that just say hobbies, but within one box, there could be a quilting book, a chess book, a, a knitting book and how to draw. Okay. So that part is all. So I take the time to sort of sort it out, out and make categories, so to speak categories, um, which I think really does help in the sales as opposed to just sort of setting them up. And however they came out of the box, I think if you go to a, a, see the tables, I had three tables this year. Um, and you're interested in knitting and you have to kind of go through three tables, you might not pick up as many, but if you're scanning, you're scanning, you see a knitting book or another, Ooh, this must be the area where the knitting books are. That's the hope. Anyway, I got some statistics they send out and what I do in the, in the rough way they estimate things, they percentage wise and how much table space, um, for the last few years, the hobbies tables have sold a higher percentage than the overall number. And whether that, that has anything to do with me organizing it, who knows? Anyway, my few little treasures from this year, um, two of which I thought there was a 50, 50 chance. I already owned them, but I decided to get them anyway. A couple of bucks, not a big deal. Um, I haven't talked about it all, but I have a lace interest. If you are new and haven't heard me talk about, it's very rare to find lace books. There were a few this year, but all those others I already owned. Um, this is needlepoint lace. I don't know if I'll ever do anything in here, but there was lots of good background information. You know, you can see it's an older book. I thought I might've owned it, but what I discovered is I, I knew this was like part of a series, like this solid color lace picture, the technique of, and I own uh, another book. It's not needlepoint lace. It's another style of lace. So it's like, yes, cool, fun. A type of lace is called tatting. And I need to remember to talk cause I've been doing a little more of that lately, um, as a travel project. But anyway, I saw, and I think I did pick see another, there must've been like a lace maker or somebody who had was cleaning out somebody's house of a lace maker. Cause there were a few, which I don't think last year there was a single lace book. Um, so tatting, I don't know if I will ever make jewelry. I, I need to learn how to do the bead part of tatting. Um, but why not? And this one, I also thought I might've owned and I didn't. Um, I do have a different tatting, tatting jewelry book. I have more tatting books than I will ever need because I so rarely do it. But it, you know, you see a book like this and you're like, who else is going to be interested? I mean, who knows? Um, I did pick up, this was, there were a few cross stitch things, a lot, nothing that was spectacular or super exciting. Um, as someone who's interested in flowers and sort of the natural world, when it comes to thinking about my own designs, looking for some inspiration, you know, to see this, which is not, I mean, this is an older thing and it, it's, it's one of those Dover publications. This is from 1980, but it's reprints of designs from 1928 books. Um, just to see how flowers are, are done and not like your typical flowers. There's, there's no like rose and lily and you know, there's, it's a little more interesting to me. And then I did find a book about samplers. Uh, and this was specifically, it's not, it, it's a lot, it's, it's, um, I can't speak. 
it's not sampler designs. It is background information, which I find very interesting. And then quite a lot of, it's from a particular collection. And I think I was telling a friend this, um, the, it's the date of this, 1978. And to see this many color pictures in a book from 1978, I think we could all agree is pretty rare. Um, I was Googling to my heart's content to find out what happened to the Theodore H. Kapnick collection of American samplers. Um, I didn't come up with any answers. Like every way I tried to phrase it basically brought me up to various listings on used book sale websites of this book and almost nothing else. So if you happen to know anything about the Theodore H. Kapnick collection, um, I would be interested to know what happened to these. Like, was it a collection that was donated to a museum? Um, oh, this, sorry, this, it is in the beginning. It was an exhibit at the Museum of American Folk Art. I mean, again, you have to assume in the late 70s. Um, to what I, I, I sort of feel like if it was in a museum collection, that would probably show up as a Google search because museums are usually good at you know, giving identifying uh, information about where the collection came from. Um, that said, there are plenty of museums out there that have just not been able to get their collections online or very minimal. Um, so it could be sitting somewhere and I just can't find it. If you know anything, let me know. I'd be interested. One last book to share with you today. Um, I have talked before about Yvette Stanton and her amazing books, mostly on white work of different types, but I think she has one or two of color. She recently came out with this book. She's, she has other Hardanger books, um, and I've made projects from a couple of her other books, not the Hardanger ones. I've shown this in previous videos. This is a new book. It is a substantial book, and it's just focused on filling stitches. And I knew I was absolutely going to get it when, you know, she started, you know, sharing about it a year or so ago. Um, I didn't know if I'd ever make anything from it, but I love the idea of having a reference book. And then as it turned out, she, her other books have like a number of different little projects. This one, I mean, she, and it was very clear ahead of time. She basically made one giant sampler. And I mean, without going through and double checking, I'm assuming every stitch that she has very clearly diagrammed. She has this most amazing, and she does for both left and right handers. Um, I believe every one of those is somewhere in this sampler. Do I think this is beautiful? Absolutely. Do I think it takes a fair amount of skill to do it as well as she does? Yes. Do I think I will ever stitch it myself? Probably not. But might I want to do some little hardanger thing and use this book as a reference for some new filling stitches that I've never done before? Sure. So I just love that I've added this to my shelf. If you have any interest in um, hardanger, uh, you might be interested in getting a copy of this. Like I said, it's brand new. Um, when did I get it? How did I get it? I don't know. There's ways to get it out there. She's from Australia. So... Um, as much as I want to, I truly want to support designers. Um, whenever I can purchase directly from somebody, and therefore I know they're getting the most money they can, I will. That said, shipping from Australia is not necessarily the most affordable thing. So sometimes I have to, this is a give and take everybody needs to do. Okay, that is a lot of mishmash from today, crossing over many different needlework categories. Um, I thank you so much for being here, especially if you're still here till the end. All kinds of links below to a lot of things I was talking about. And again, all my Nashville designs are now available in my Etsy store. You can go check those out. Um, thank you so much for giving a little bit of time to me. I know so many options out there. I really appreciate it. If you can, hit the like button, you know, leave a quick comment. Those kind of things always help with the YouTube algorithms and are always very appreciated for me, but for anybody, especially floss tubers like who just want to have more people know about them. Thank you so much. Until next time. Bye.